I'm just going to ask Michael if um, or Maria if they could stop sharing uh, and allow someone to uh, yeah allow me to share my screen. Okay, uh, so it's uh, it's time for us to start this webinar. Uh, just like to um, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, from around the around the globe. It's uh, uh, very exciting uh, to be here, and uh, and we are grateful to uh, WABIP, uh, Michael Mendoza, and Ambu for asking us to uh, uh, share with you some thoughts on the clinical role of single-use bronchoscopy. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, uh, co-attendees uh, uh, and um, co-hosts. Uh, firstly, Dr. Sonali Sethi, uh, Director of Interventional uh, Pulmonology at the Cleveland Clinic uh, in the USA, uh, and uh, Assistant Professor um, uh, Jonathan Kerman, who is Director of Interventional Pulmonology at the Medical College of Wisconsin, Wisconsin in the US. So it's a real pleasure to um, have you both here. Um, what, uh, what, what we intend to do is to go through uh, three talks. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen now. And uh, uh, essentially uh, they will be 25 minute talks uh, and then we'll move on right at the end to the uh, question and answer session. Hopefully that'll be an interesting forum for discussion and we would encourage all of you to uh, speak or, or put in the chat any questions, any comments uh, any controversies that you'd like to raise. Um, uh, that'll make that uh, make this the most useful um, uh, most useful um, uh, of uh, webinars. So uh, what we intend to do is talk about the clinical role of single use bronchoscopy in the ICU and its impact on clinical workflow and guidelines. And then we'll move on to the, uh, the bronchoscopy suite uh, and interventional pulmonology, looking at its clinical value and advantages of bringing single-use bronchoscopy into that space. And then uh, concluding with cost and an overview of cost-related aspects of single-use and reusable bronchoscopy, and indeed the organizational impacts. So without further ado, um, I'm going to um, uh, talk about single-use bronchoscopy in the ICU, current and future clinical impact. Um, I'm a respiratory and critical care physician in London in the United Kingdom. I'm also an interventional bronchoscopist and I work uh, half time in the Bronx suite uh, as well as uh, in the ICU. Uh, here are my declarations, uh, research grants, um, uh, advisory board meetings um, and speech, speaker honor area and educational grants. However, I have no affiliations to any uh, single uh, industry or company. I'm going to start with uh, history. It's always a good place to start. So uh, we're all familiar uh, in this forum with Gustav Killian in 1894 and the esophagoscope through which um, he was able to retrieve a foreign body from the larynx and publish that as a case report. 
which really initiated the, um, the visualization of the airway proper uh, that was then developed uh, some years later uh, through the use of the light source and suction channels to the rigid bronchoscope with Chevalier Jackson. And of course, there were uh, further developments uh, until uh, one might consider this the, um, the origins of modern flexible bronchoscopy and Shikedo Aikida with the uh, Nakita uh, company uh, was able to develop this device and, uh, and then take it uh, and promote it as uh, something worthwhile. Interestingly, um, in terms of history of the bronchoscopy in the intensive care unit, um, uh, he actually took it to the American uh, Thoracic Society uh, surgical conference. And uh, he was uh, identified by uh, Sackner, uh, who, uh, who persuaded him to um, uh, provide him with uh, one of these uh, flexible scopes. Uh, and Sackner used it in his ICU uh, and then published a whole range of um, uh, case reports and series demonstrating its use uh, in ability to intubate patients in the early 70s. Uh, indeed, for patients with sleep apnea with uh, vulnerable airways uh, and also developing the nasal route for bronchoscopy. And in chest in 1972, he published those applications of bronchofibroscopy. Um, and then it was in the uh, in the 1980s that the first charge coupled device uh, uh, was developed by Pentax uh, and effectively the first videoscope uh, came into use. Ambu were the first uh, company to, uh, to produce a single use bronchoscope in 2009, the A-scope 1, and that has developed, um, as we will talk about later on, now into the, uh, uh, the uh, A-scope 5 high definition, the latest, um, uh, the latest generation of technology. When we talk about um, bronchoscopy uh, in the ICU setting, and of course uh, beyond that, then um, it's important for us to consider needs and responsibilities. And we all wear different hats. Uh, and if I just um, allude to some of those uh, different responsibilities. So as a clinician, what do I want um, uh, from the bronchoscopy that I'm asked to do? I need to make sure that my patient uh, um, indications are clinically relevant. I want to make sure that this is going to be as safe as possible. As a bronchoscopist, I want uh, the equipment to work such that I can perform the procedure technically well uh, in as quick a time as is possible, uh, but to achieve the goal that I'm intending. If I put my clinical director's hat on, of course, I want those things, but I want to make sure that there's equity of access, equity of opportunity, and not wastage unnecessarily. And then if we think about our roles as educators, we want to try and transfer uh, the skills and competencies that we have uh, built up uh, to get minimum standards and hopefully uh, excellence in the workplace and reduce that variability that, uh, that can lead to um, uh, error and uh, poor outcomes uh, as we aim for uh, the best outcomes for all of our patients. But equally, uh, if I put my research hat on, uh, I, like anyone else, wants to uh, be, um, uh, I want to have the new technologies available to me. I want to test them out. I want to see how robust that evidence is. And I want to see ultimately where it's going to fit uh, in my workplace and then in others. Now, as opinion leaders, um, uh, uh, we have a, a further responsibility. We need to understand where this technology uh, is going to fit uh, in the broader scheme uh, of things. And we have to understand things like high income, middle and low income uh, countries. We have to ensure that wastage isn't, um, uh, isn't um, uh, is kept to a minimum, but also uh, that other ideals like sustainability um, uh, and so on are, uh, are considered. But if I take it back now to the clinical level and the clinician level, I'm just going to talk you through some of the things that we all know, but in the ICU setting, what are the indications for bronchoscopy? And I've numbered them one to nine, and this is not an exclusive list, but essentially uh, infection identification, 
and uh, uh, particularly ventilator-associated pneumonia. We've uh, used that um, uh, bronchoscopy increasingly, although there's very limited evidence as to its definite benefit uh, in that regard. What we do know is that can, it can reduce uh, unnecessary antibiotic usage uh, by taking distal samples. And interestingly, during the COVID period, where uh, broadly speaking, uh, 40 or 50 percent of patients that were sampled using new technologies like PCR were found to have secondary bacterial infections, depending on which studies one looks at. And then, of course, therapeutic uh, lavage for collapsed airways. Uh, and if it's done properly, then it can have uh, both a physiological, uh, clinical, of course, and radiological uh, effect. Um, uh, and then there are uh, slightly less, uh, uh, less common uh, uh, adverse events such as uh, tracheal perforations, but you know, using it as a problem-solving tool can be very important in these settings, uh, or indeed uh, tracheal flaps uh, following tracheostomy. Uh, with acute uh, airway obstruction thereafter. Foreign body removal, uh, number five, again, uh, picked up uh, and uh, uh, one is aware of the possibility of that, then the bronchoscopy is, uh, is an essential tool in that setting, as it is for uh, difficult airways and planned or even emergency procedures where uh, the purpose is to provide a definitive airway, even in complicated scenarios. And there are less common but equally important um, uh, indications such as uh, persistent air leaks and the use of uh, expiratory only valves that are uh, part of bronchoscopic lung volume uh, reduction but have a, uh, have a role to play in persistent air leaks in the ventilated patient. And of course, uh, uh, percutaneous tracheostomy for direct visualization of the airway um, uh, to try and minimize damage um, or risk of damage to the posterior wall and to ensure uh, appropriate um, uh, positioning of this definitive airway. And then, of course, uh, Burns inhalation injury uh, as a niche esoteric um, indication uh, to be able to grade the injury that we know portends a worse outcome in cutaneous burns. So there are all those um, uh, indications uh, for which bronchoscopy in the ICU setting is important. And here listed, um, uh, perhaps in order of um, relevance and frequency, are the airway management in the anesthetic room, um, and of course, confirmation of the endotracheal tube positions, uh, assessing the mucosa, source of bleeding, sampling, uh, uh, segmental collapse, and um, uh, fistulae, and then therapy, of course, uh, the use of therapeutic lavage with adjuncts, um, tracheostomy, uh, foreign bodies, airway hemorrhage, which is a, another rare but very important and often life-threatening um, indication for appropriate skilled bronchoscopy uh, in this particular setting, together with less common but sometimes uh, important uh, interventions such as stent placement. And then if we think of uh, what has happened in terms of the transition from um, uh, the traditional video stack uh, reusable uh, bronchoscopes, uh, it would seem there's been a natural transition to reusable single use scopes over uh, perhaps five to seven years, in fact. And here, just some illustrations of um, the, uh, the previous um, in the top panels, uh, reusable scopes for um, uh, intubating patients nasally or in very sick patients um, uh, or even through non-invasive ventilation, and now to um, the transition where, uh, in fact, uh, having the uh, reusable scope and monitor at the bedside or indeed in the, uh, in the operating theatre uh, makes it accessible, portable, uh, and provides one with a range of different options in these settings. So why, why has this happened is one of the questions. Well, uh, Convenience is the most obvious uh, explanation for it. Uh, the fact that you've got a, uh, a carryable, portable um, plug and play system uh, that provides adequate optics. Um, and I say adequate because that at times has been um, uh, a question mark. And it also depends on what you're expecting. And uh, if someone is doing a bronchoscopy in an ICU and they're not really that interested in uh, where the problem is, but merely to try and clear the secretions, well, I would suggest that that's um, a, a missing opportunity. Uh, in fact, and that will come to later on as the opportunity to use 
uh, single use scopes to try and drive education and improved uh, training. But we also know that with uh, improving technology, higher definition is going to uh, uh, make this uh, much easier. And then uh, the use of um, uh, the question is single use bronchoscopy for all procedures in the ICU. Uh, one might expect so, but uh, you have to question more complex diagnostics and therapeutic needs. Here, an example of someone with a post tracheostomy uh, acute um, uh, critical stenosis, a cicatricial stenosis of the airway, where a um, uh, a stack system wasn't available at the time, and so uh, one had to compromise and use a, um, uh, an ambuscope, uh, as it happened, uh, with serial dilators to actually uh, provide a catastrophe. And at the head end of the bed is the thoracic surgeon in case of um, um, a need to open the chest. So, so, you know, it has been used. That's not to say that it should be used. What about airway hemorrhage? And in this case, on an ECMO patient, um, uh, that's the reason he uh, remained alive. Severe catastrophic bleeding, uh, organization of clot and the use of cryo uh, extraction to try together with conventional means of therapeutic lavage, DNAs to try and uh, provide some meaningful uh, aeration of the lungs. Can it be done through, um, um, through current um, single use bronchoscopes? Yes, should it? That's a, that's a question for us to discuss. And uh, indeed, as a, um, uh, as a problem solving tool where you've got uncertain diagnoses and monitoring, uh, in this case, a very sick patient immunocompromised with SLE and HLH, who developed uh, work of breathing problems, re-intubated, and uh, was found to have a, a profound pseudomembranous ulcerative um, tracheobronchitis. You can see here, this was a, um, a reusable conventional video stack system, but then subsequently with um, uh, with the newer uh, monitors um, uh, for the uh, single use scopes, we were able to provide uh, adequate enough serial um, monitoring. Here, for example, uh, again, uh, a rare uh, condition, tracheobronchiopathia osteochondroplastica in a patient who was on ECMO, uh, who was thought to have severe asthma. Uh, once you've seen it, you'll never forget it, and then you know what the diagnosis is. Uh, uh, here we were using a, um, a conventional reusable scope, but, and this wouldn't have perhaps provided us with an adequacy uh, at the time um, and with the quality of single use scopes and monitors that we had available. Um, however, that may well be uh, different now. And here, of course, uh, um, uh, as alluded to, uh, persistent air leaks, we know that balloon isolation and expiratory only valves can be very effective. This is not uh, something that is done with single use bronchoscopes, but it raises the question and the opportunities uh, that are available as the technology develops. If I now switch tack slightly to um, what the projected uh, development of single use bronchoscopy is going to be. Well, if you look at this, um, uh, this projection from uh, the US uh, over time, you can see that it's an estimated $2.5 billion industry by 2025 uh, with uh, increasing amounts of clinic, hospital use and diagnostic center use. Um, uh, why? Uh, well, if one considers clinical demand drivers, there's an increase in COPD here on the bottom right, uh, third uh, leading cause uh, of death worldwide and increasing, uh, particularly as uh, smoking in, um, uh, in the uh, middle and uh, lower income countries uh, becomes on the rise again. Um, if we look at lung cancer, again, lung cancer uh, here is the fifth uh, commonest cause of um, uh, death globally it is increasing. Uh, and then if we look at uh, the ICU specifically and aging populations, and here I've taken one example of uh, a trend upwards in the, um, the percentage of ICU uh, admissions uh, as uh, an increasing aging population uh, starts to um, uh, knock on the door of, uh, of the critical care departments. So all of those are going to increase the demand uh, for uh, airway um, assessments. And these, uh, these data are from uh, uh, AMBU, uh, for which I'm grateful. Uh, they show Q1 and Q2 um, uh, in red, 
uh, or deep pink. And you can see that there's a gradual increase. If you, uh, 2020 was, uh, of course, uh, a slightly anomalous year, uh, 2020 and 21 as a result of the COVID effect. But you can see the gradual uh, trend upwards here. This is uh, data for the A-scope Bronco of worldwide sales, over a million. Uh, worldwide sales. And uh, in fact, the NHS safety stocks um, led to shortages because of uh, huge demand. But what this doesn't tell us is, was this because of more cases? Or was this because uh, the in inability to, uh, to use uh, reusable scopes less? Uh, or was it a transition from um, reusable scopes to single use uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy sped up by uh, COVID? And I think more granular data would be helpful in this regard, uh, particularly uh, in the context of uh, high, middle and low income uh, countries. Um, and of course, we have to think about uh, uh, quality of life data as well, uh, not just uh, uh, growth trends in um, uh, in the market value. Because remember here, if the, these are single use scopes, so they're used once and uh, they should be thrown away, they're not single patient scopes, but that in itself uh, could lead oh, to- um, uh, question. Yeah. Uh, yes. Dr. Singh, so I'm very sorry, but um, there are a lot of attendees wanting uh, you to have the uh, the presentation slide, slides in full screen. Okay, I can do Is that. that. Possible? Sure, sure. And let's just take Thank it you out. so much. So, sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. Uh, so, uh, so sorry. Thank you. That. Okay. Um, Michael, does that uh, uh, does that work? A lot better. A lot better. Thank you so much. Okay. So if we look at um, uh, the expansive uh, industry R&D to engage that potential opportunity, you can see that there is an ever increasing uh, list of uh, uh, industry companies uh, who, are, um, uh, who are using this technology and uh, filling the marketplace. And that's uh, leading to excellent competition and no doubt driving uh, the, 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 the speed in technology. Uh, and there are a number of different um, uh, quality factors in regard to the um, uh, to the bronchoscope uh, production that are becoming increasingly uh, beneficial to the end user. Uh, now, if we look at um, the single use potential advantages over reusable scopes in bringing new technology to the clinic, well, this is about um, the innovation cycles. And again, this is uh, data from AMBU that have been provided. If we look at um, uh, progress from 2009, this is ASCOPE 1, uh, the developed uh, 2011, uh, and then through to 3 in 2013, uh, the four in 2017, and now we move to the five. That's a rapid change over in development, uh, as opposed to broadly speaking, the reusable product life cycle of five to seven years uh, for the reusable uh, scopes, although that may well be changing. Um, but nevertheless, that, uh, that does suggest that um, technology is advancing quickly, no doubt as a result of um, high output, low uh, manu manufacturing costs. But it also raises the question, is this indeed too quick for health healthcare systems that are, broadly speaking, um, a little more cumbersome in taking on technologies and certainly uh, uh, moving to uh, the next uh, generation of technologies? And so the question there is, uh, how does one uh, control that? Uh, and are these new technologies are all necessary in, for instance, the ICU setting? If we stay on the theme of these drivers to single use bronchoscopy, and here I've highlighted five uh, areas. Um, now, um, infection prevention uh, and control clearly has been uh, uh, prime and foremost in the, um, in the COVID uh, period. Um, um, but, but also there's been uh, increasing um, identification, uh, particularly from the US, uh, the FDA, and a number of organizations, endoscopy organizations, of picking up um, uh, endoscope contamination and indeed uh, secondary infection, cross-contamination and patient infections that have been identified. Yes, they're very low, less than 1%. Uh, however, they can cause uh, significant impact. And as a result of this, um, uh, 
uh, and these attributable infections, um, there is um, there is move to regulate, and the recommendations are slowly coming out uh, to uh, uh, to try and improve the um, uh, the reprocessing systems and reusable scopes, but also to to introduce single use scopes. Um, in those uh, in those domains, particularly where there's a higher risk of infection, or indeed where there are pathway flow problems that could uh, be sped up, and no doubt we'll hear more about that in the regulatory um, side of things. The utility side of things is clearly obvious: the convenience, the portability, the accessibility. Although um, uh, there are studies that suggest that uh, the sturdiness of the single use scopes is still not quite uh, uh, of the reusable scopes in certain settings. Um, if we then move across to technology and innovation, the flexibility of being able to uh, develop uh, newer and better technologies to get them closer to the optics of um, the reusable scope systems, uh, compatibility such that plug and play uh, for the different types of scopes, um, irrespective of which organ they're being um, uh, utilized for is, is very important. Uh, and the tools that are becoming available um, uh, that, that are already available for reusable scopes in the Bronx suite now becoming available in other areas uh, in, the, um, uh, reuse, uh, in the single use scopes. I've put in gray connectivity and AI. Connectivity, um, whilst it's appreciated that it's uh, absolutely crucial to be able to have uh, images uh, sent to a repository, uh, either such as DICOM uh, or PAX images, uh, we're, we're not there yet. And that's going to be an, uh, the next big, um, I think, technological advance. And then, of course, uh, uh, where does artificial intelligence help us uh, with these new technologies? Finally, at the bottom here, uh, the economics, I put asterisks around costs um, because uh, that's something that um, uh, hopefully Jonathan is going to sort of um, allude more to and uh, that'll be very interesting to hear about. Sustainability, of course, and that's another discussion point uh, that we might bring up um, uh, in the forum later on. In terms of some of these regulatory development drivers, uh, these allude to the US and the United Kingdom specifically. July 2013, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence promoted the adoption of the ASCOPE Bronco. Um, uh, remember, this is a body that uh, is independent of uh, companies, asks experts and opinion leaders to look at the evidence and try and make a cost analysis of whether or not uh, a new uh, device or a new um, therapy uh, is appropriate to bring to um, the NHS. It recommended, uh, continued to recommend it in 2020, and the um, uh, Anesthetic Association of Great Britain and Ireland uh, highlighted the single use costs and safety benefits um, in 2020, uh, suggesting also that uh, bronchoscopes should be used in COVID patients, which uh, became uh, almost de rigueur uh, whenever they were used. And then in 2021, the FDA recommended single use bronchoscopes for patients at increased risk of infection spread, as you've just heard about. And indeed, in April 2022, there was a safety letter following an urgent recall of a reusable bronchoscope and rhino laryngoscope due to inadequate reprocessing methods. Again, raising uh, the, the relevance of single use uh, bronchoscopy. If we come now to the evidence for single use versus reusable bronchoscopes, um, I think this is a good quality evidence light and I, I will uh, merely highlight a few papers that are uh, relevant to the discussion, uh, but in no way do they, um, do they suggest uh, in any definitive form uh, one being better than the other. Uh, this is a nice review article by um, uh, Septimu uh, Murgu's group um, essentially, single use scopes and reuse um, uh, can provide a shorter time to commence procedures. This was in ICU patients, a small, small cohort. Um, uh, they were found to be low risk uh, in, to healthcare worker um, in uh, the ICU setting during COVID uh, in 40, 40, 47 bronchoscopy uh, bronchoscopists um, uh, uh, in that setting. If we look at um, 
uh, they're using, uh, and they seem to be comparable for uh, intubation and use in the ICU from this um, multi-center uh, randomized study. And they looked at a number of different um, uh, factors like safety, like time uh, for procedure, like following um, uh, infection risks, et cetera. If we look at um, uh, their use in COVID-19, and I'll come to that uh, in, a, in a slide or two, they were recommended for use in the ICU it was suggested to avoid unless necessary. And we, like others uh, and uh, institutional bodies, um, uh, produced evidence and guidance based on uh, oftentimes uh, practi practical uh, common sense. Um, if we looked at, uh, at percutaneous tracheostomy, they, uh, in terms of uh, quality, they're equivalent, but there may well be cost savings. And importantly, it reduces the risk of damage uh, to the reu reusable scopes. Um, slim scopes for nasal intubation simulation uh, seem to be at, at least as effective as uh, reusable scopes. And there's been some bench testing for suction capabilities between the Boston and the Ambu scopes. And uh, again, that drive to further development is, um, is ongoing. I mentioned COVID-19. This is in the non-ICU setting. And Broadly speaking, uh, different uh, groups have come up with very similar advice that, uh, uh, as we're now um, uh, all aware of, that uh, only um, urgent or uh, emergent cases uh, uh, should have been done uh, with full uh, PPE and ideally in negative pressure rooms to try and reduce the risks to healthcare workers of this aerosol uh, generation and very high risk procedures. Uh, that said, in the ICU setting, and I speak from personal experience of looking after hundreds of patients as no doubt all of you have as well, um, uh, in that first wave when we weren't using um, uh, heat humidifiers uh, for the circuits because of concerns regarding aerosolization, I saw a huge number of uh, secretion load uh, desaturations, uh, particularly on proning patients that required emergency bronchoscopy. Uh, and we, like others, uh, were keen to try and promote the idea of um, uh, using the bronchoscope as they were always used in those safe settings and uh, producing guidance on how to mitigate um, aerosolization by um, uh, videos and, uh, and, and publications. If we now sort of move to the final couple of um, uh, two or three slides, the idea about ongoing clinical research training and education in ICU bronchoscopy and competencies. Uh, what emerged from COVID was this concern about um, sampling, uh, both uh, the efficiency of sampling, but also the safety of sampling. And for, um, for the longest time, um, we have not used um, uh, adequate um, personal protection uh, at, at the bedside, uh, nor have we uh, been, uh, nor have we scrutinized our practice of sampling. And this has allowed us to, um, uh, to, to start to do some studies. This one that we're running is the Rasical study, looking at safety and efficiency of a particular closed system uh, sampling device against standard sampling. Uh, and this is the first step to try and develop and understand variation in practice, and perhaps through that improve um, uh, practice and good practice. Um, and through uh, education uh, programs, uh, ours like many others, but we're trying to improve skills, but not just skills, to improve competencies and use of single use scopes together with um, reusable scopes uh, for the standardization of training through frequent skills and education, such that we can get uh, ICU bronchoscopy in trainees to the level uh, that uh, occurs with fellowships that uh, many of us have gone through in the bronchoscopy suite. So in summary, um, single-use fiber optic bronchoscopy is an exponential growth period currently. Uh, and it's uh, you, over 50% of visualization sales are in the ICU anesthetic sector. There are a number of factors that are driving its adoption, the convenience, portability, improved quality, uh, the COVID impact uh, has been significant. Uh, and of course, regulatory concerns around infection uh, of reprocessing uh, techniques rather than specifically the reusable scopes themselves. We have to consider economics and sustainability. 
uh, technological advances are quick. They're approaching um, uh, reusable scopes for acceptability. Diagnostics and increasingly therapeutic options are available even in the ICU setting. So we're getting closer to that um, uh, reusable scope um, uh, offering. But adoption almost seems to be ahead of good quality research. And but one of our responsibilities is going to be to regulate and, and provide good practice guidelines. Where should these be used? In what context? And when uh, should the reusable scopes be used? But there are opportunities for research, education, training to mirror pulmonary programs. And as we embrace the revolution that, uh, that we're in now, you know, we have to remember that technology, as has been said, is neither good or bad. It's what you do with it that makes the difference. And we have a responsibility uh, both to ensure that it is economically uh, feasible and sensible, that our patients, uh, as examples of society, benefit, uh, but we, uh, as healthcare providers, benefit uh, together with our partners with industry, and of course, the sustainable uh, footprint that uh, still needs a lot of um, work. Because remember, uh, to me, it's, um, it's somewhat disconcerting to, uh, to have to throw away um, a single use scope after, after one use, although we have to do it. Um, uh, and, and yet we don't have a, uh, a disposable, dissolvable scope, which I hope will be something in the future. And recognizing that uh, there will be coexistence of single and reusable scope technologies. With that, uh, I thank you. And I look forward to uh, discussing uh, hopefully some of the points that I've raised from this later on. Great. Okay, well, um, with that, I, I hope we can move straight on to uh, Professor Sonali Sethi. So, um, Sonali, uh, looking forward to um, your talk. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Singh. Do you mind um, allowing me to share my screen? Okay, there we go. And um, am I in presenter view? Yes, yes, you are. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So um, I want to start by saying uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the country. And thank you once again for taking your time out on the weekend to uh, join us um, for this discussion that we're having today. So I'm going to talk to you today about the clinical value of bringing single-use bronchoscopy into the bronchoscopy suite. So most of us are probably already using disposable scopes in our ICUs. However, the majority of us are probably not at the point where we're actually using these in our bronch suite. In full disclosure, I'm not quite there either. We're not using these in our bronch suite currently. However, after putting this talk together and doing a literature search, I've convinced myself that it's very much food for thought and I need to start uh, thinking about changing my own clinical practice. And the hope uh, from my talk is that you'll feel the same way at the end of um, this um, discussion. So my objectives today are to review the FDA guidelines with you, get a better understanding of where these are coming from and why bronchos and what exactly are bronchoscopy associated infections. We're gonna go through some of the most important papers that I think are out there with regards to infections. Uh, we're also going to discuss why reprocessing our reusable bronchoscopes is such an issue. Uh, what do we require of single-use bronchoscopes if we want to bring them into our bronch suite? What is the environmental impact of all of this? I know a lot of us are very uh, environmentally conscious at this point. And finally, what my own conclusions and thoughts are after going through all the literature. So since 2015, the FDA has issued multiple safety communications on infections associated with reprocessed flexible bronchoscopes. They in fact started an ongoing comprehensive inve investigation into infections associated with reprocessed reusable medical devices. And, and they started working with federal partners and manufacturers and other stakeholders to better understand the critical factors um, that are contributing to device associated patient infection and how to best mitigate it. This is actually called the MOD report. It is out there. Um, it is accessible to everyone to see. Um, and um, in recent years, because of this, the FDA actually started posting safety communications and warning letters related to reusable flexible bronchoscopes that potentially compromise patient safety. So 
where is all of this coming from and what do we know? To, what we know today is that reusable flexible bronchoscopes pose a risk of nosocomial infection transmission between patients uh, with the identification of human proteins, DNA, and pathogenic organisms on fully reprocessed scopes, despite us doing full adherence um, to guidelines. So I'm gonna go over um, why that might be and what we have actually found in the literature. So contaminated scopes have been linked to numerous cases of infections and pseudo-infections. We all know what an infection is, but what is an, a pseudo-infection? A pseudo-infection is isolation of infectious organisms and specimens due to colonization or contamination of the bronchoscope. So between 2015 and 2022, there were 867 medical device reports which were submitted with actually seven deaths related to infections and reusable flexible scopes. The most frequently reported organisms you can see here were Mycobacterium, Pseudomonas, Serratia, and Klebsiella. Even when the FDA reports, the true incidence of infection related to bronchoscopy is most likely underreported. And why is that? So, so a lot of this is fault from our own. So symptoms from an infection may be masked by the patient's underlying condition. So you don't actually realize that this is an actual infection that you're dealing with. As a bronchoscopist, you may not actually know all the micro, uh, microbial isolates that are in your facility to recognize an unusual pattern. So you may not be picking up on the pattern of what's going on when an infection is recurring again and again. Uh, microbial contaminants very easily get labeled as a colonizer by a lot of us. And of course, there's always the fear of legal repercussions um, that we each have. So this is a first paper that I wanna highlight. There's three main papers in the literature that I wanna to go to. And this was um, a paper that was titled The Pseudo Outbreak of Adenovirus in a Bronchoscopy uh, Suite. So this academic center found a cluster of adenovirus and bronchoalveolar uh, lavage samples. All um, bronchoscopies were inpatient bronchoscopies and they were actually performed in a single bronchoscopy suite. They found that 10 patients had a positive adenovirus PCR, PCR and eight out of 10 patients had bronchoscopies done with one of two bronchoscopes. One was labeled scope A and the other was labeled scope B. Of a total of 11 patients who had a bronchoscopy with scope A and had adenovirus testing, you can see here that six or 55% of them had molecular evidence of an adenovirus infection. Of a total of 24 patients who had a bronchoscopy with scope B and had adenovirus testing, 17% of these ones were positive. And, and they did note in this paper that the reprocessing area, because they went and looked at this, did not yield any deficiencies that they could see. So the conclusion of this paper showed that bronchoscopy-related pseudo-outbreaks are occurring despite standardized procedures for high-level disinfection that are occurring in our own suites. Of a total of 35 patients, 30% 30 tested positive for, for adenovirus, and that's a very significant number, 30% of these patients tested positive. This was a second paper that was published in CHEST um, in 2019 uh, by one of my partners actually here at the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Mehta. And uh, the title of this paper uh, was Bronchoscope Related Superbug Infections. The aim of this study was to investigate the risk of bronchoscopes transmitting infections of carbapenem resistant enterobacteria bacteria, and multi-drug resistant organisms. So in this study, they did a PubMed search and found 12 reported cases of bronchoscopes transmitting carbapenem resistant enterobacteria or multi-drug resistant organisms. They excluded any cases that involved rigid bronchoscopes or other type of mo uh, microorganisms such as mycobacteria and fungi. And what they found was that 10 out of 12 reports stated that the scopes had been reprocessed according to guidelines. So again, they were stating that their reprocessing guidelines were appropriate. The conclusion of this study was that reusable bronchoscopes may pose an under-recognized risk for transmission of carbapenem-resistant enterobacteria and other multi-drug resistant organisms. And even though, even when high-level disinfection guidelines are followed, this process actually may not be effective. They additionally noted that damaged reusable bronchoscopes increase the risk of this transmission. 
So the last paper that I think that's very important uh, to highlight was also published in CHEST. Um, this is probably the most highly cited paper with regards to infection that uh, was recently published out there. And this study was done to evaluate the effectiveness of real world uh, bronchoscope reprocessing methods using a systematic approach. So this was a prospective observational study that was done in three large multi-specialty hospitals in the US. What they did was they examined 24 clinically used bronchoscopes. Nine of them were therapeutic, nine were pediatric, and they had six EBOScopes. And they actually had two newly acquired therapeutic bronchoscopes that had not been um, actually used or reprocessed as of yet. And they went ahead and measured levels of protein, ATP, and infectious organisms both before and after manual cleaning and high level disinfection of their scopes. They um, had microbial culture samples, which were harvested from ports and distal ends using sterile swabs. Um, these were moistened with sterile deionized water, was placed into transport medium. Um, this was done um, the same at all three centers. Um, channel effluent was actually obtained using a flush brush flush technique and channel swabs and effluent were then placed in, an, in a neutralizing broth. Uh, proteins were actually detected in samples from 100% of bronchoscopes after manual cleaning. I wanna say that again, it was detected in 100% of these scopes. Microbial growth was found in 14 fully reprocessed bronchoscopes. So 55% of manually cleaned scopes and 58% of the high level disinfected uh, clean scopes. At two of the sites you can see in this graph on the right hand side, the reprocessing was inadequate um, as a result of multiple episodes of non-compliance with guidelines. So I'm sure that's happening actually in a lot of our institutions. We all try our best. However, even in the third site, which you could see here, which is site A, where the reprocessing met national guidelines, there was still an unacceptable high level of bio burden that was found on these scopes. So what they found um, in these scopes is that they observed irregularities on 100% of clinically used bronchoscopes. And they identified things like cracks, as you can see here with this EBOScope, there was fluid, there was discoloration, there were scratches, there was filamentous debris, there were dented channels that were seen. These were more pictures that they're posted of, of examples of debris that were founded and dented channels um, that were seen within all these scopes. So the results of this paper showed that bronchoscopes had visible residue and uh, debris. There was a high contamination at all sites. Reprocessing practices actually vary from institution to institution. Damaged bronchoscopes were in use at all of these sites, which is probably happening at all of our sites as well. And storage conditions were insufficient. So what does that mean for those of us that are in the Bronx suite? Contamination is occurring more often than we think and quality improvements need to be made now. So we can no longer after looking at these papers sit aside and ignore these issues. We actually need to start addressing them. Because of that, um, and Dr. Singh uh, mentioned this before, there was the FDA released this statement on June 25th, 2021, that said you need to consider using single use bronchoscopes in situations where there is an increased risk of spreading infection or when there is no support for immediate reprocessing of the bronchoscope. So this includes multi-drug resistant organisms, immunocompromised patients, patients with prion disease, of course, everything changed with COVID-19. So when we're treating patients with COVID-19. And so again, the time to start thinking about switching to single use bronchoscopes in our suites in these situations is now. So what is it about our reprocessing of our reusable scopes that is such an issue? So as we know, bronchoscopes are in contact with mucous membranes um, and we don't enter sterile tissues or the vasculature with the actual scope. So devices in this category warrant a high level disinfection. When a bronchoscope is used for a procedure that breaches the mucosa, it is then recommended that the accessory that breaches the muc mucosa is either single use or undergoes uh, sterilization. That's why most of the tools that we use in the suite now or, or on the floors or wherever we go um, are, disposable, um, are disposable things that we're doing. So these are your, your EBIS needles, your forceps, your brushes, even, even your cryoprobes now, everything has essentially gone to disposable. So 
what is going on with reprocessing of our scopes? I actually did not realize how complicated this process was until I spent a day with um, actually um, one of our, our reprocessing um, technicians um, who went through this uh, step by step with me. And I'm not going to go through this. It's a very, very complicated uh, process. And these are all the key elements that are actually uh, need to occur in reprocessing, re reprocessing our scopes. I actually didn't know that staff need to wear like full on PPE. And that means it, they need to um, have on masks, gloves, they need to be gowned. If PPE is not used, then the staff are at an increased risk of infection and they can recontaminate fully processed scopes. Mechanical cleaning needs to be performed as soon as the procedure is finished. And then you need to obviously go on to your leak testing. You need to assess the integrity of the scope coupled with brushing and flushing. And then the scope undergoes high level disinfection. The, the reprocessing area itself um, needs to be near where the bronchoscopies are taking place. You don't wanna be walking through the hospital with dirty scopes. Um, from one location um, to another. So the soiled scope should be brought to the reprocessing area immediately after pre-cleaning um, in the procedure area in order to avoid contaminants drying on that outer surface and the internal channel of the scope. And the reprocessing area has to be separate and have proper temperature control and ventilation. Uh, this actually is our reprocessing center here at um, the, the, the Cleveland Clinic. And there has to be a separate entrance for your dirty scope and you actually have to exit uh, a separate entrance with a clean scope. So as you can see here, this is us walking into our reprocessing area. You enter with your clean scopes first, the pre-cleaning takes place first, you then get to, and your leak testing, you then get to your high level disinfection, clean scopes then need to exit from a separate exit and then get hung appropriately within closets with space between scopes. So for high level disinfection, this can be a manual process or you can utilize an automated uh, endoscopic reprocessor. It's actually recommended that it be an automated endoscopic reprocessor. You can only use disinfectant solution, which is approved and the scope has to be loaded in the machine appropriately. And after cleaning, like I said, the scope has to be stored in a hanging position in a cabinet with appropriate aeration and with adequate, adequate space between the scopes to prevent cross-contamination. So even after doing all of this, let's say we do all of this appropriate, we have the proper setup, how are all these scopes getting contaminated? So as I showed you, there are damaged scopes. I showed you a lot of examples of this. There's actually inadequate manual pre-cleaning. There's contaminant reprocessing equipment. There's disinfectant failure. That means there's not enough chemical concentration. There's not enough dwelling time that's happening with these scopes to soak. There's recontamination that can occur after disinfection. And then there's inappropriate uh, storage. So you can see here that there's many, many, many steps at which point your scopes that we currently are reusing can get infected and cause trouble in our suites. So if you're starting to think now that, okay, I need to start thinking about using reusable scopes in my suite, what are the things that are important to us about single-use bronchoscopes and bringing them into our suite? So obviously their clinical performance is very important. This is just a very, very short list. Obviously many companies um, are working on high quality reusable scopes. They all understand that this is the future of bronchoscopy. Dr. Sink showed you a slide of that. This is a very limited list of current bronchoscopes that are available. These were only some of the pictures I can find. That, you know, this did not include Storts or Access or Cogentix or some of the other ones. Um, that there's a lot out there. Um, and as you can be, as you can see from some of these pictures, there have been design changes that are going on with the scope. So some of the companies are making working channels that are designed differently to possibly allow for better suction. Uh, people definitely uh, companies definitely want the scope to hold and feel like your reusable scope you you want it to actually feel like uh, it has the same exact quality um, as the current scopes that you're using um, the swivel designs are very important we've all gotten very used to using those swivel designs um, that has been companies have been very cognizant of that so um, they're working on next generation scopes to get it as close as possible to that feel and quality of what your current scopes are doing in the suite. 
So what are the desired attributes you would want to have of these scopes? So I thought about this and I kind of made up a list. So for me um, to use these scopes in my suite, I would, I would want them to be versatile, meaning that they can be used in a wide array of diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. We don't have a lot of scopes yet that can be used in certain diagnostic procedures like EBA scopes. However, um, a lot of the scopes that are out there could be used um, in other diagnostic things. It could be used in peripheral lung nodule work. It could be used in a thera therapeutic arena within um, central airways. Um, so some of it is there, but some of it still needs to be worked on. Um, you need to be able to easily maneuver the scope. You want to be able to get into certain subsegments. You want to be able to swivel the scope. You want to make sure that the angulation is right. You want to be able to do tube rotation. Um, it needs to be both convenient and efficient um, so that you're getting the job done with just that scope. Image quality, um, this was already brought up in the past. The image quality needs to be equivalent to what we currently have. We need to be able to visually have a good three-dimensional aspect of what it is we're doing in these airways. And we need to be able to store those images. We need them to be able to communicate with the current um, uh, software programs that we're using now um, to, to type up our bronchoscopy notes and to store all our images. And um, we want a portfolio variety, meaning that there are many different sizes of scopes that I can use depending on what it is that I need to be able to do. So there are a couple of papers that have started to look at these attributes with single use sco scopes. So this was one um, that was um, a, a little more recent and this was a prospective observational study. And the purpose of this study was to assess the quality of the A-scope 4 based on 300 bronchoscopies in 21 Spanish hospitals. So bronchoscopists actually, you know, after, after going through this and, and filling out their questionnaires and whatnot highlighted its portability, the immediacy of use, and the possibility of taking and storing images. Overall, the A4 scope uh, scored well for ease of use and imaging and, and aspiration. Um, there's an A scope 5, uh, which is about to be launched that you are all aware of, um, and that should have even more enhanced attributes. In addition to um, this paper in the literature, there are many other operator perception studies that are starting to come out. This is another study that was looking at the Baffin scope compared to current reusable scopes. And uh, they found that the single use um, scope had the advantage of better maneuverability and actually better suction um, in, in, uh, when, when they had um, both attendings and fellows um, rate uh, these scopes. What about the environmental impact? We are all very environmentally conscious of these scopes and, and it's a lot of plastic that we have uh, in our hands. And what are we doing with these scopes um, after we're using them? This was one study I was able to find actually on in, in environmental impact. This was a comparative study on environmental impacts of reusable and single use bronchoscopes. And what they wanted to do was compare CO2 equivalent emissions and energy consumption from a single use scope and a reusable scope. They found that reusable scopes have a comparable or higher material, material and energy consumption, as well as higher emissions of CO2 equivalents. Therefore, single use scopes are safer for the environment is the conclusion um, of this paper. I also know uh, in speaking to some of the companies, I did try to see and, and look online to see what recycling programs are currently available and companies are actually actively working on recycling programs for the scopes so that we're not just throwing them away away so everyone is environmentally conscious of these things and hopefully these programs will all be put into place very soon in all of our um, hospitals so um in conclusion, um, this is the list of the advantages that I find of single use bronchoscopes over re reusable bronchoscopes and moving towards them in my own Bronx suite. And I hope that uh, you're agreeable with this list that I was able to come up with when I thought about this. So um, some of the advantages of single use scopes, obviously is I went through the whole reprocessing. I went through all the steps that could possibly go wrong. I went through papers that showed that we're not all very good at doing it despite the fact that we wanna be good at doing it. And even when we are reprocessing scopes adequately, um, that we're still having a lot of issues with our scopes. So single use scopes don't require any reprocessing. So we take care of that issue that we are currently noticing going on. 
Um, certain, uh, we, we've gone over some of the infection papers um, that I hope convinced you that there are advantages in certain patient populations. I work at a huge lung transplant um, center. Infection is very important in these immunocompromised patients. So uh, lung transplantation is definitely one place where I think, you know, me doing my BAL and my surveillance transbronchial biopsies with a flexible scope uh, that's reusable, uh, that's a, a, a single use is probably better than a reusable scope where I'm could possibly be cross-contaminating patients and not realizing I'm doing it because we're masking a lot of this or writing it off as, as, um, as, as that is part of the infec uh, infectious process of these patients or it's a colonization. So other immunocompromised patients that we may have, um, those patients obviously with prion disease, not something I see often, but definitely something I learned that, it, that needs to happen. And in fact, if you use a reusable scope in a patient that has a prion disease, the recommendation is that scope has to be completely taken out of commission and thrown away, or the same scope has to get used in that same patient again and again, but cannot be used in any other patient. Um, what about those patients that are risk of spreading disease or virulent germs such as TB or hepatitis? Um, I think this is a great place that a single use scope needs to um, happen in our Bronx suite. Um, and then I was thinking, uh, you know, what about I train a lot of fellows in bronchoscopy training in my cadaver labs. This is a, a perfect place. Why should I be using um, the reusable scopes um, in those cases? Um, other things that I was trying to think about um, how this could be useful is they could potentially, single use scopes could potentially decrease delays between uh, procedures when you're waiting for scopes to get clean. So for instance, you know, we only have a certain number of hybrid scopes, and sometimes you're waiting, another room used the hybrid scope, you're waiting for it to get cleaned, you want it for a peripheral case. If I had a reusable, if I had a, a, a single-use scope that was the same size, I, I could use that instead, and this could potentially allow me to increase the number of bronchoscopies that are performed in my suite. Um, how about the end of the day, um, when you're asking everybody to stay because you have a late case that's going on and the scope needs to be cleaned, and, and the reprocessing staff need to stay as well. So it could be used at the end of the day so the staff aren't required to stay and, and they could go home at a decent hour. And what about the off hours? So when I'm on call and I have to come in in the middle of the night or on the weekends, it's difficult for me to get the scopes cleaned. At that point, I don't have my normal staff here and I have to send it out. So I do the initial pre-clean, but then there's probably hours that are taking place before that scope is actually getting cleaned. And this may be where um, using a single use scope would be a much better situation. So having said that, I'd like to um, thank you and, and I would uh, welcome any questions that you may have at the end of the presentation. Fabulous, thank you, Sanayi. That was an absolutely fantastic um, uh, walkthrough. Really appreciate it. And um, I know there'll be uh, uh, questions and discussion um, uh, around those uh, interesting points later on. So um, without further ado, uh, let's ask uh, Jonathan and Professor Komen to um, uh, share his slides and uh, over to you, Jonathan. All right. Uh, congratulations, everyone. You've made it through uh, two thirds of the presentation so far. And uh, uh, hopefully this one is last but not least. Um, so with that being said, uh, my name is Jonathan Kerman. I direct the Interventional Pulmonary Program at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Um, we're a 700-bed tertiary care academic medical center. And I'm going to uh, be discussing the uh, cost of single-use bronchoscopes and their organizational impact. Here are my disclosures. The two that are relevant to this talk are my relationships with AMBU and Boston Scientific. Here's the agenda for what we'll be going over today. Um, first, the basics of health economics, uh, then health economics of, of actually introducing single-use bronchoscopes. Uh, and then we'll touch on the organizational impact that this introduction can have, as well as uh, summarizing the key points at the end. So let's get started with the basics of health economics first. So I just wanna get everyone on the same page with with exactly what I mean when I talk about health economics, uh, because this is the foundation uh, for a more in-depth discussion on costs. So health economics, to be specific, is the application of economic theory and, and empirical techniques to the analysis of, dis of decision-making with respect to health and 
healthcare. And it's important in determining how we improve health, health, health outcomes. Uh, it gives us the ability to provide better health care for more people. And most importantly, it forms a foundation for optimal resource allocation. In contemporary um, economic analyses, uh, what's considered the best approach for determining the economic impact that a new technology or a new product is going to have is the micro costing approach. And what this is, is a formal way of dissecting all of the costs and expenses that go into a particular uh, procedure, product, or technique. Um, so oftentimes we will think about capital equipment. That's kind of obvious. So, that, so in this case, that's your bronchoscopes, your racks, your reprocessors. But then we don't always consider reprocessing and repair and maintenance. And with reprocessing, as Sonali mentioned, um, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, full PPE, all of the cleaning products, so detergents, the water that is actually used, as well as the brushes, sponges, and cloths that are used to clean all of these devices. And then repair and maintenance is probably the one that is most underappreciated. Um, and this is gonna vary among institutions, but the best way to assess it is oftentimes looking at prior repair reports, um, how many repairs you've had and how much those have cost, and the average time that it's taken uh, for those repairs to occur because there's an opportunity cost here as well. And so again, micro costing is really the most precise way of collecting cost data uh, because it is comprehensive. And the focus here is the incremental cost relative to the alternative. So in this case, it's the incremental cost of a reusable or a flexible bronchoscope relative to the baseline. And then um, micro costing studies uh, are good because they can estimate uh, cost savings when you look at the difference between uh, um, uh, one product and the other. So it's, it's that difference that is key. All right, now let's continue on to the health economics of actually introducing single use bronchoscopes. Um, this has been looked at in a number of different studies. Um, here are three that have come out within the past five years. Uh, and these are studies from Singapore, France, and the UK. Um, <clears throat> and they looked at the total incremental costs of of, of, of using, or sorry, the total incremental cost of, of actually introducing a reusable flexible bronchoscope into the ICU in the first two studies and into the OR in the third study. And what they found was that the cost per procedure with a reusable flexible bronchoscope ranged from, from $318 per procedure to $351 per procedure. And in each of those studies, they were able to calculate a financial savings by shifting to single use products, ranging from $17 per case all the way up to $81 per case. And when you multiply that by the number of cases that are performed annually in a large hospital, uh, that can really start to add up to significant savings very quickly. In addition to these actual real world studies, there have also been different different modeling studies that have been conducted. This is a cost utility analysis um, that came out about two years ago. And they compared single use flexible bronchoscopes to reusable flexible bronchoscopes from a UK national health system perspective. And they used a decision tree model for bronchoscopy procedures specifically in the ICUs. And what they found was that single use flexible bronchoscopes, SFBs, are associated with a cost savings of over 200 pounds per case, as well as actually a small gain in quality adjusted life years. Um, so uh, that's kind of a nice added uh, benefit um, in this case. Now, all of the studies um, that I've mentioned so far have focused on either the ICU or the operating room. We haven't really delved into the Bronx suite too much. 
Last year um, at uh, uh, the ISPOR meeting, which is the International Society for Pharmacoeconomics and Outcomes Research, um, data was presented uh, for the first time um, on microcosting actually in the bronchoscopy suite. Um, and in this study, they looked at a university hospital in Denmark, uh, and they identified incremental cost savings of 133 euros per case with single-use flexible bronchoscopes. And based on an annual procedural volume of about 700 cases per year, they were able to project over a 90 thousand euro cost savings on an annual basis. Um, and that's when you factor in things like capital costs, repair costs, overhead costs, as well as reprocessing costs. So all of those ancillary costs um, really start to add up. Now, I know that I've mentioned, you know, the, the, the capital equipment expense as well as the reprocessing expense. But another uh, significant expense area is repairs. And this is one that is often underappreciated. More data are emerging um, on the extent of repair costs and more importantly, the variability of repair costs. Um, these are three studies over the past four years. Um, the first one is from uh, France and the second two are from the US. Uh, and these are published uh, data looking at the average repair costs of bronchoscopes. Um, and these are just regular bronchoscopes, not any, um, not, not any EBA scopes. Um, in the French study, uh, they looked uh, at the use of bronchoscopes in multiple settings within a single university hospital. So scopes being used in the ICU, OR, bronchoscopy suite. And they found an average repair cost of about $2,500. Um, in the first American study, um, they looked at four different hospitals, actually, and multiple settings within each, each facility, and they found a repair cost range uh, of about 3300 US dollars to a little over $5,000. Uh, and in a more recent study uh, published by myself uh, and my partner, um, we looked at uh, bronchoscope repair costs uh, for bronchoscopes strictly used in the ICU setting uh, in, 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 in our uh, facility. Um, and we had repair costs that were significantly higher. Um, in fact, they were over $13,000 uh, per scope per year on, on, on average. <clears throat> now let's shift over to the organizational um, impact. So the organizational impact um, first uh, uh, drew attention uh, in 2016. Um, and the 2016 study was all about identifying all of the different areas in the hospital uh, that would be impacted by the introduction of single use flexible bronchoscopes. And they identified these different categories, um, 12 in fact, that are listed here on the right, logistics, um, architectural and, and infrastructural design, budget allocation, accessibility, working conditions, uh, vigilance and monitoring methods, uh, modes of cooperation and communication, uh, training requirements um, and skills needed, uh, type and level of involvement um, of the patient and care, uh, patient flows, patient pathways, and then uh, work processes um, as well. Um, and then the next step occurred uh, a couple years later in 2018, where they actually delved into determining how uh, single-use flexible bronchoscopes actually impacted each of these categories relative to their reusable counterparts. Um, and they did this by, by developing a series of questions uh, pertaining to each of these categories. And then they posed those questions to the different constituents involved uh, with bronchoscopy. So doctors, nurses, administration. And ultimately what they uh, did for each of those categories was determine, was determine um, whether single use flexible bronchoscopes or reusable flexible bronchoscopes 
caused the least burden upon being introduced to the to the organization. And they found that in 75% of those categories, so nine out of 12, single use flexible bronchoscopes were actually associated with, with less burden to the organization overall. And in the remaining 25% of those categories, the burden was equivalent between the single use flexible bronchoscopes and the reusable counterparts. So those three equivalent categories were budget allocation, accessibility, and type and level of involvement of the patient slash, slash care. Um, interestingly, uh, in the hospital um, in which uh, this study was performed, uh, which was a um, uh, large um, uh, university French hospital, um, they found that single use flexible bronch soaps were actually a bit more expensive for them. But the hospital actually, after this study, uh, still converted uh, to the use of single use flexible bronchoscopes simply because of the positive organizational impact it would have. The fact that, the fact that, that it would be so much less burdensome to the organization as a whole was enough to outweigh some of the economic uh, impact. So now I just wanna to shift to the, to the key points. So number one, uh, micro costing. Um, this is a great tool for understanding uh, the cost and setup. Uh, so when you're talking about, uh, about um, uh, the, the impact of, of of introducing single-use flexible bronchoscopes to an organization, um, microcosting will allow you to to truly assess your current cost of your reusable flexible bronch program. Um, and to that point, um, there will be uh, new data coming out looking specifically at microcosting within the bronchoscopy suite. Um, and uh, those preliminary data are going to be uh, revealed at the upcoming ISPOR meeting um, in Vienna uh, in November, um, and that involves three uh, U.S. Um, hospitals um, where, uh, where we did microcosting analyses um, uh, for busy bronchoscopy programs, and we focused on the bronchoscopy suite. Um, number two is the organizational impact. Uh, this can't be overstated. Um, costs are important, but costs are one component that should go into the, dis in, into the decision-making process. Um, uh, uh, as I mentioned in that, in that last study, um, uh, in certain instances, the costs of reusable bronchoscopes may be greater uh, than their reusable counterparts. That's not typically the case, but it may be in some instances. But still, the organizational uh, burden decrease that, 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 that you get with reusable scopes uh, may be enough um, uh, uh, to, prompt that, to prompt that conversion. And then finally, um, when you're looking at uh, data when it comes to reusable flexible bronchoscopes, uh, and single-use flexible bronchoscopes, um, it's important um, uh, to focus on, on high-quality economic analyses, namely those that employ a micro-costing approach, since that's the most accurate. And some of the older literature doesn't necessarily do that. So it makes it difficult to compare some of the older economic literature uh, with the more contemporary studies. Here's the references uh, for the different studies that I cited. Um, and... Uh, this is the hospital at which I work, and this is my, this is my work email. Um, please feel free uh, to reach out if there's any um, uh, further questions. Um, but with that being said, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, open up uh, the discussion here uh, for some Q&A. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, fabulous. Uh, three really interesting, thought-provoking uh, talks so uh let's uh, let's open it up to the panelists and see um uh what questions you have maybe we could ask you to raise your hand and uh, it would be great if you'd be happy to um say where you are who you are where you're from 
and what your question is. Um, so um, uh, it's open for discussion and comment. Uh, while I'm um, while we are waiting, I, I might just ask um, Jonathan. Um, J Jonathan, um, I was interested in the uh, the significant difference in the in the repair costs of the uh, the bronchoscopies for right for the ICU uh, in different settings. Um, what what are the sort of thoughts around that? Um, so uh, I agree. Um, uh, the repair costs are striking um, among uh, the limited data that are there. Um, they are all higher than I thought they would be. Um, and some, uh, namely my own, um, uh, were significantly higher than I anticipated. Um, <clears throat> Uh, when we looked at, at, at our center, um, we looked at uh, bronchoscopies that were performed in the ICU setting only, um, and we did so over a three-year period. Um, those bronchoscopies were performed um, by by trainees and by different um, and by different attendings, um, depending on the ICU. So, um, at least uh, in my hospital. Um, uh, the, the neurocritical care or the cardiac critical care folks or the surgical critical care folks all perform their own bronchoscopies. Um, uh, and so there are varying levels of experience, especially when it comes to trainees. Um, and then uh, how we have our setup structured is we have a central repository um, um, consisting of uh, about uh, uh, seven bronchoscopes that are used um, kind of every day, all day, uh, they are, um, reprocessed of course, after they are used, but, um, but there's no ownership per se. Um, uh, it comes from a central, uh, supply. Um, and then, uh, you don't get, um, feedback, uh, if the scope is, uh, uh damaged during use. And so I think there's a lack of, lack of, um, appreciation or awareness, um, among users, um, that may lead uh, to um, to uh, less careful usage. And I, I would, you know, concur with that. I guess any of us who've seen it, um, uh, it's inevitable that uh, uh, potentially less experienced hands leads to increased risk. Um, but you have to mitigate that. And in certain situations, one could almost. Uh, uh, pseudo legislate and say, look, uh, this is a complex procedure. It's, it's more likely to lead to risk, you know, a tracheostomy, for instance, uh, that's going to be where we're going to use the single use scope. Um, uh, if, if you need better visualization, there's concern about a, an underlying malignancy or something unusual, maybe that's where, um, uh, you know, from a diagnostic perspective, you want to use the better imaging of the reusable. But, you know, these are these are the, I guess, the refinements that um, we're, we're, we are going to have to think about uh, as we uh, adopt this symbiosis of reusable and uh, uh, and single use. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We have a question here from um, uh, Fotios who asks, um, is it safe and meaningful to reuse a single use bronchoscope on the same patient after manual cleaning? It's a great question uh, uh, because it's uh, it's a vexed issue. Um, these are single use uh, for the for the reasons that we said, um, uh, and they are um, developed as such. Um, and if you just think about this, there is some uh, limited uh, data publications from Brendan McGrath and others that have bench tested um, these scopes that have been left out and haven't been cleaned or have been cleaned. And there is a definitely significant increased risk of persisting contaminated uh, bacteria uh, within a, uh, I think an eight hour period uh, uh, of uh, sedentary um, use. Now, the question is, um, what if you flushed and cleaned these, uh, uh, these uh, single use bronchoscopes? And the answer to that is we do not know and we don't have robust evidence. And um, I think one of, the, um, one of the rate limiters to good practice needs to be that we don't necessarily perform best practice even with the single use scopes. Uh, I, I've seen it in our own institutions that they're, they're, they're left out there for a few few hours afterwards. 
no one flushes them through, no one wipes them down, uh, no one uh, necessarily leaves a must be thrown away by this time um, indicator. And, and I think that is a really important point. And uh, if it was me as a patient, I certainly wouldn't want that being re reused on me um, a few hours later. Uh, who knows what's in that, in that working channel? So, so I think um, the correct answer is it needs to be thrown away. Uh, but I think uh, the answer to your question is, there isn't uh, evidence to robustly suggest whether or not um, uh, one can leave them out for a certain period of time after cleaning. Uh, uh, I don't know if Sonali and, uh, and Jonathan would like to sort of make comments on that. It's a really important point. Uh, I'm in agreement with you. Everything I read in the literature is appropriate to what you were saying. Um, the scopes tend to sit out for a while and they get a lot of biofilm. And although we may think we're doing a good job, like I showed you of cleaning scopes, we really aren't. And um, I, I would be very weary of using a single use scope in another patient as well. And in fact, the recommendation is, is not to even use the same scope in the same patient hours later Correct. or the next day. It is truly single use that one time and to um, then get rid of it. Yeah, uh, for sure. And you know, um, it, it, otherwise it might only be a matter of time before we uh, get uh, uh, you know, those uh, safety alerts uh, as a result of recurrence of infection in the same patient or a new uh, ventilator associated pneumonia in the same patient. Um, which of course leads into the question about uh, health economics and costings of uh, the, the burden of plastic that has been thrown away uh, straight away uh, after its use and uh, where we are and where we sit in terms of the sustainability goals. Um, and I don't know whether, um, uh, Sonali, Jonathan, you have any sort of um, thoughts on that. I, I know our industry partners, as, as Sonali, you said, are working hard to try and find solutions. But as I understand it at the moment, there isn't a, um, a, a in a sense, these are mitigating solutions. So they will buy back um, carbon, if you like, from another uh, program, but uh, these are still disposed of uh, through incineration or other um, uh, means. A any thoughts on that? No, again, like I said, I, I did try to look in the literature. There was the one paper that I found that I presented. And then in speaking to a lot of the companies, they, they're very aware of this. Um, I know Ambu is actively working on a program right now that um, hopefully will be launched very soon. So I, I think they're aware that the scope usage is gonna go up. They're very environmentally conscious. And so I, I'm hoping that it's something that will be addressed quickly. Yeah, I, I think based on what I've uh, you know read uh, myself and what I've you know seen is, um, I think that that there is a um, a more tangible environmental impact um, when you're talking about single use scopes and that you have this you know this plastic device that you're gonna throw out. Um, but I think people fail to realize all of the um, energy uh, and detergent and you know supplies that go into reprocessing reusable scopes. Um, and so when you compare those, you know, side by side, um, uh, based on what I've read, it is actually um, the reprocessing of the reusable scopes that has a greater environmental impact uh, than disposing of a, a single use uh, device. Um, and that's at baseline when you add in, you know, recycling programs um, on top of that. Uh, the difference is clear um, in that single use is probably the more environmentally friendly um, uh, uh, path. Yeah. Um, and um, just in terms of, you know, the, the interesting question about how procurement and, you know, and different organizations, how, how procurement, uh, you know, what that's going to be based on. It's usually based on um, uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, Jonathan has already um, uh, alluded to. But then, how do you, um, how do you, how does one balance that period of time of transitioning where you will be using both types of um, system, right? Uh, which will inevitably lead to a, an increased cost uh, upfront until someone has made that decision to uh, wean down and off 
a reusable system in that particular environment. And, and that's a challenging one, right? I've, I've seen some uh, calculators online to sort of facilitate that type of uh, work. But um, I, I think that's, you know, that's where the conversations need to be clinician, procurement, um, uh, per string holder and industry, right? Yeah, I, I, I think for a while, um, there's going to be um, um, a balance that we have to strike um, between which cases we're going to do with a reusable scope and which cases we're going to do with a single use bronchoscope. Um, you know, up until uh, very recently um, in, 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 in Europe uh, and, you know, soon to be in the U.S., we didn't have, you know, single use bronchoscopes that were capable of doing all of the interventional work that we do. Um, I think we're, you know, probably getting to that point or we're, you know, possibly there now um, with some of the latest model uh, scopes. Um, and so for a while uh, there, we're going to kind of have to balance things out, but, you know, eventually, uh, you know, we may, you know, shift to a complete um, uh, single use option. Um, you know, it, it just depends. I think that there are, you know, certain patient populations like Sonali mentioned, uh, lung transplant patients, other immunocompromised hosts, where we probably should be using single use uh, products preferentially. Um, and then, you know, eventually uh, we'll be able to incorporate them into our more advanced procedures um, as technology improves, um, which I anticipate will be uh, in the near future. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really exciting um, you know, prospect, isn't it? And um, in fact, uh, Manaldi Rasmin from Indonesia uh, puts in the chat that in certain uh, certain situations, you know, those special victim conditions, landslides, earthquakes, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, this kind of portable uh, technology uh, is uh, really needs to be um, promoted, developed pre-hospital care, for instance. You know, um, this is exactly the kind of area where um, uh, uh, in my own sort of burns inhalation injury um, area, you know, these are the kind of things where uh, one could actually um, uh, find important niche uses for it that, um, uh, that are actually basically uh, better than nothing, right? So, um, so for sure. Um, um, if we just get back just briefly to, to, to the technology, um, are we happy that uh, we are uh, that the quality of the images, which was for so long uh, the concern uh, in uh, in single use bronchoscopy, uh, are, are sort of at the level that we would uh, be happy with in the, in the interventional bronch suite. I, I think they're getting better and better from what we see. Every generation of scope being, every generation of a scope that comes out, the imaging just gets better and better and. Um, I think we're at a point with these some of these next generations that are coming in where we can plug them into the current Bronx suites that we have with all the screens and HDR screens. Um, for those of us who have recently updated our suites or been lucky enough to that it will plug into all of our HDR screens and actually give us that good quality imaging um, that we're, we're used to. And so I, I just think that we're gonna be at a point where they're gonna be very equivalent. Yeah, yeah, and, and and the connectivity, as you were alluding to, is uh, is, is a really important uh, aspect as well. I, I know the companies I speak to that we all speak to, you know, the the moves towards Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and so on. Uh, so long as the GDPR rules are um, uh, you know, are, are made allowable and permissible, uh, I think uh, they're all working on those. Um, uh, yeah, so, so just to maybe just to conclude a uh, couple of questions about education and where we see uh, and training and, and where and then research, where, where do we see the important um, uh, value of single use scopes in uh, helping to develop training and education and what kind of research studies do you think would be worth, uh, worth doing with, with these scopes? Um, education and us, training, yeah. you, you mean directly to yeah. the fellows. So um, I'll openly say most of our scope damage is probably because of the fellows. Um, so, um, but you know, like I said, my first year fellows, at least when they first start out, um, they learn bronchoscopy, which is basic. They learn BAL transbronchial biopsies, and that happens to be all our lung transplant population. And so I think 
for me, when I've been thinking about how to incorporate this in as the next generation scopes are coming in and we need to think about bringing them in, um, to me, that probably would be the first place I would be starting um, is, is there. So I think then as the scopes get better and better and, the, and you're, you, you get more confidence in being able to do the high end work that needs to get done, like the airway tumor obstructions that are in the airway and you have that you know, good control and vision that you need when a bleed happens or whatnot, I think then you'll easily start transitioning into that. And then hopefully uh, we'll be getting EBUS scopes very soon. And, and that causes even more damage than your regular scopes with the fellows. We won't have to worry about those punctures anymore with the needles, you know, destroying the channels. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very easy way to incorporate it into those practices where there are a lot of fellows in education. Um, I don't know, Jonathan, yeah. how do you about that. Yeah, I would agree with everything that you said, uh, Sonali. Um, I, I, th I think that single use products are uh, hugely beneficial for training um, in that you don't have to worry about damages. And then I think they also facilitate training internationally um, where, uh, uh, where they may not have um, lots of reusable equipment. Um, so it uh, uh, facilitates a broader reach, broader exposure. Um, uh, so I think it's just making bronchoscopy more accessible to more people globally. For sure, I, I think that's uh, uh, that, that's exactly right. I'd resonate with uh, with all of those comments. And uh, from a research perspective, uh, final question, I guess: um, Is there a particular study that you would like to be? See, uh, um, I, I, I'll sort of uh, mention my, my um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, uncertainty here is I don't really have a sense of where the single use scopes are being used. I, I as you've seen, you know, the, the, uh, they're being uh, bought more and more. So, you know, there's an exponential growth in terms of market value, but I, I don't get a sense of the... Um, uh, the usage, uh, the drill down usage, you know, in, in, in the ICUs, in the OR, in, um, uh, and, you know, regionally. And I would be interested in that to understand where the, where the gaps are, such, a, such that, you know, one can focus attention for these technologies in, in appropriate areas. And that, that's my, my own um, sort of interest. Yeah, I think I think in our own institution, what we've seen, and, and I think COVID was the big changer of this for everybody, is that ever since COVID hit, we basically no longer in our ICUs are, or our ORs are using um, reusable scopes whatsoever. I don't even know if the fellows know where the tower is anymore that's hidden in the room, you know, in the ICU. If, if there's something high end, we're the only ones, the interventional pulmonologists are the ones who are taking our reusable scopes and our towers to the bedside, but they're just grabbing you know, these disposable scopes and doing whatever they need to do. And every anesthesiologist now is just using disposable scopes for all their intubations and whatnot. And when I get called in to help them, if there was a mild bleed, that is what they are handing me. So yeah. I, I think that has basically been a complete switch in the past two years. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just because the quality of scopes have gotten better and better and better, and people are more comfortable with them. Right, right. I think from my standpoint, um, so I agree with everything uh, Dr. Sethi said. I think that um, there's this pervasive uh, mentality um, that single use scopes are an inferior product. Um, and I think that historically they have been, um, but with the latest generation, um, I think that, uh, that the gap is narrowing uh, and may in fact uh, be gone. Um, so what I wanna see from a research perspective is I want to see um, that the that the single use products are just as good um, as reusable uh, products, and I think that you know how we can accomplish that on a small kind of realistic scale is uh, uh, pick pick a given procedure, uh, do a series of cases uh, with the single use scopes, do a series of cases with the reusable scopes, maybe randomize one to one. Um, and uh, see if there really is a difference. Uh, uh, is the complication rate higher with one? Is one taking longer than the other? Um, are the outcomes different? Uh, and I think that um, I think that we'll be surprised um, how minimal the differences are, if any. Um, and I think that that will go a long way to dispelling some of these preconceived notions. 
it's another absolutely an app. Yeah, so go ahead, uh, Sonali, sorry. Yeah, no, and another one is, is um, with regards to what Jonathan is saying, you know, I know he, you gave that one study on 700 scopes and what the cost was, and, you know, a cost analysis study on, is there a breaking point of a certain number of procedures that your hospital performs that at that point, it's no longer beneficial? What is that breaking number? Is it 1,000? Is it 2,000? Is it less than 1,000? Like, I think that would be very interesting for a lot of institutions that do a lot of uh, high volume uh, bronchoscopy, because I feel like that's the pushback, um, you know, a lot of places are going to get. So if we had, if we had some kind of economic breaking point of this is the number of bronchoscopies, at uh, which point it's no longer efficient to use it, I think that would help all of us when we're moving forward yeah, too. For sure. And and there is, I'll, I'll try and post it later on, there is a, as I was alluding to, a, sort of a calculator that, um, uh, some German folks have uh, sort of created uh, to try and sort of assist with that uh, breakpoint um, calculation. Um, we have uh, some uh, comment. We have some questions here. One, one of the questions was um, uh, from Singapore, the University Hospital, uh, from a respiratory therapist, um, uh, Billy Garros. Um, Most of my consultants prefer to use reusables because of stronger suctioning, good graphics. Uh, suggesting that the angle is different from the, in the ambu in terms of viewing angle. Any improvements? Um, I, I would say yes to all of those. Um, from my own experience, um, you know, the scopes um, are uh, certainly bench testing them, uh, very equivalent um, uh, to uh, some of the reusable scopes that uh, that we use. Um, certainly for um, for standard procedures, uh, you know. Um, Simple diagnostics, infection, uh, uh, low bar collapse, uh, etc. Um, there was a question about: Is it any good for uh, the ambuscope for stenting procedures? And to that, and I'll ask your comments, um, guys. To that, I would say uh, hasn't been tested yet, and uh, I've certainly not tried putting a stent in by using a um, uh, an ambuscope or a Boston or any other uh, single use scope. I haven't yet um, either. Uh, maybe with this next generation AMBU 5 scope that comes out when we can get our hands on it, certainly can try, um, but yeah. haven't actually used it in that situation yet. Yeah, so so I haven't used um, uh, single-use products for advanced interventional uh, bronchoscopy procedures, um, uh, but we, um, we did do um, um, some bench research um, uh, comparing the ability uh, to put um, different uh, different products like stents, balloons, etc., um, through some of the um, uh, different single-use options that are out there, um, and then uh, looking at how um, how those affect flexion, extension, etc., relative uh, to their uh, to their reusable counterparts. Um, and uh, I'm still waiting to hear back um, about the abstract for that, uh, for the WCBIP meeting, uh, but hopefully um, I'll be able to share those data uh, with everyone um, at that uh, meeting. So, uh, so stuff's gonna, in the works. You're going to keep us guessing. For now, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Um, well, we, we're, we're looking forward to hearing. And um, th there was a question uh, from Nihad Osman. Um, uh, about uh, how long you can keep uh, one of these single-use scopes out and then reuse it. And, and I think we would refer you, now to the conversation that we had earlier on. Um, I, I don't think that they should be left out and reused. Um, uh, and, you know, if this was a, a new tracheostomy, for instance, you may wish to flush it, wipe it, uh, and keep it there for some minutes, you know, uh, um, uh, an hour in case there was a complication that you needed to deal with. But I think beyond that, and I can't give you an exact timeline, uh, one just has to be aware that biofilm and, um, uh, and accumulation of uh, bacterial load uh, is, is developing all the time. So then remember, there are they, are, they are single use, not, not even single patient. Uh, reused. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think that is, uh, let me just see, are there any other questions? I think that's um, 
that's probably a wrap. So I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, uh, Sonali, Professor Sethi and Professor Kerman uh, for a fabulous um, uh, discussion and excellent uh, talks today. Um, I've learned uh, a huge amount um, and thank you to the panelists and thank you to the, um, the contributors uh, and to the listeners. Um, we wanna thank uh, Michael Mendoza from WABIP and to our uh, friends at AMBU for uh, making this possible. So with that, I think there's gonna be a recording that will be available to everyone. Uh, wish you a good morning, afternoon or evening and um, have, a, have a great day. Take care. Bye everyone.